joined by an international analyst who doesn't reside in South Africa, who travels the world looking at uh, global markets, uh, focusing particularly on currencies. Uh, his name is Jamil Ahmad. He's from FXTM. Thank you very much for joining us, sir. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure. Good stuff. Now, global markets are largely in the red today. Uh, is this some form of uh, profit taking that's taking place? Um, and what do you see as the key drivers driving markets today? This is an interesting question because we had previously seen that positive U.S. session over the past couple of days. U.S. markets were making record highs and it looked like we're going to see a little bit more risk appetite in the markets. But today, markets are back in the red, both in Europe, Asia, and probably maybe even the U.S. session later today. And you have to wonder what's changing the sentiment. And I think the main catalyst is most likely geopolitical tensions between North Korea and the United States, making investors a little bit more risk, risk off, means lower stock markets, higher gold, and probably a higher Japanese yen. Now, obviously, you focus a lot on um, currencies. Do you think we're going to see more weakness in the U.S. dollar? And what does that then mean for Fed Reserve policy? Another good question. So the U.S. dollar has obviously been dropping now for consecutive months. And only last week it hit its lowest level since early 2015. We're seeing a little bit more support for the dollar this week. But on an overall basis, I still think the U.S. dollar has got further room to depreciate. It comes down to uncertain U.S. interest rate policy. Nobody really knows what the intentions of the Federal Reserve are right now. A few months back, they wanted to raise interest rates higher, higher, higher. Now that rhetoric seems to have changed, and there's more of a negative voice coming out that interest rates should be left unchanged. Then on top of this, you've got uncertainty over Donald Trump, particularly progress with legislative reforms. A lot was promised when he entered the White House, but we haven't seen really any progress. So investors are becoming a little bit impatient there. And with these geopolitical tensions as well, you're seeing just a little bit of an unconvinced appetite towards investing in the dollar. Okay. Now let's move to um, the UK, where the Bank of England is going to pronounce, or maybe has already pronounced, on monetary policy as we speak. Um, inflation in the UK is racing. Um, it hit about 2.9% for August on a year-on-year -year basis. The target is 2%. Um, but on the other side, you've got Brexit negotiations, which frankly look like they're not going very well. Um, um, and which could scupper economic growth prospects for the UK. So what does the BOE do? Exactly. Um, the Bank of England are now in a very interesting position. And some people could say it's a catch-22 situation. Inflation is obviously very high. Um, you're seeing price pressures increase in the United Kingdom. Most of it's because of the sterling weakness since the EU referendum outcome last June. And it's now starting to filter through on the economy. But other aspects of the economy, apart from jobs data, you're seeing more of a disappointing data read in 2017. Uh, the United Kingdom looks like it's going to be the weakest G7 economy, which warrants lower interest rates. And then you've got so much uncertainty with the Brexit, nobody really knows what's going on. There's not much progress. And obviously with the Brexit, you're going to have economic uncertainty. So the Bank of England now have got to make the decision. Are they going to raise interest rates because price pressures are beginning to get very high? They're exceeding wage growth which is not good for the economy. But at the same time, when you've got so much economic uncertainty and uncertainty as a whole around Brexit, it probably warrants lower interest rates and interest rates to maintain at their record low. Because if there is uncertainty with trade with Europe, or there is uncertainty over whether exports from the United Kingdom could come into the question because nobody knows what the trade agreement is going to be, this means there's a need for higher private consumption. There's a need for domestic economy to receive some momentum. It basically warrants lower interest rates. So it's going to be interesting to see what the Bank of England say about this today. We know there's two dissenters in the Monetary Policy Committee. So this is the committee that vote for interest rate rise or to keep rates unchanged. We're looking to see whether there's any more dissenters join the committee this month. Well, we wouldn't want to be in their shoes. Um, just give us your view, Jamil, on the oil market. Uh, many analysts that I speak to here suggest that the days of oil being, Brent crude being at $100 a barrel are long gone, as, as we saw them a few years ago. Uh, and, and that's simply because they say that the U.S. shale gas producers are able to fill any um, supply gaps. Would you agree with that sentiment? The oil industry has definitely changed, and this is one of the battles that OPEC continuously face. Uh, the industry has changed. OPEC are no longer as in control of the industry as they used to be. This is a primary reason why the oil market still maintained very low. Um, it was $100 three years ago, now just bouncing around $50, sometimes a little bit lower, sometimes a little bit higher. We're seeing a lot of hesitation from investors to take longer term positions on oil because they do not see these oversupply dynamics changing. So basically, there's still a lot of oversupply in the markets. 
too much supply for what there is demand for the commodity. Mm -hmm. And this is making investors hesitant. I wouldn't say necessarily that oil can't recover over the medium term and longer term, because you never say never in finance. However, clearly investors are still put off from these longer term positions and you can see they're playing these ranges between $45, $55 and seeing how the oversupply dynamics play out in the future. Here in the South African economy, what's uh, been a key piece of information for us um, is this news from the Reserve Bank that our current account deficit widened to 2.4% of GDP uh, in the second quarter. Now, um, that should be RAND negative, and indeed we have seen that the RAND has uh, got a little bit negative as a result. Um, but the question that I want to put to you is, as an international investor, when you speak to other investors and with the hat that you wear, how do you perceive South Africa as an investment destination relative to other emerging markets? I think that what investors are looking at right now is this expectations that the Reserve Bank of South Africa are going to begin an easing cycle where they're going to be lower interest rates and hopefully it's going to improve the domestic economic fortunes. This is what we're looking at at the international scale. And there is a scope there for the Reserve Bank of South Africa to actually continue to cut interest rates if it wants to. It wouldn't surprise me with inflation now drifting below 5%. There is a decline in economic data. You're seeing private investment is something that needs to be encouraged, that the bank could actually reduce interest rates to encourage consumer borrowing, corporation borrowing, to actually stimulate the domestic economy. Well, let's hope so. We've run out of time. Thank you so much, Thank Jamil. Uh, well, that was uh, Jamil Ahmed. Uh, he's from F F FXTM, uh, joining us from his international travels, giving us his international perspective on global issues and uh, domestic ones. After a short break, Nzinga has more business news for you.